Albert Camus was born on 7th of November 1913 in Algeria to a French family. His father died a year later during World War I, leaving Camus' mother to care for him and his brother. They lived in a poor neighborhood of the capital Algiers with his grandma and his disabled uncle. At primary school, he met a teacher who helped him get a scholarship to enter a prestigious school in 1923. Some 30 years later, in his Nobel Prize speech, Camus dedicated the prize to that same teacher. Despite his working-class background, his European heritage allowed him certain privileges like good education, enrollment in a football club that were not available to most local Arab Algerians. But when it comes to health, there is no privilege. In 1930, Camus, aged 17, contracted tuberculosis, which put an abrupt stop to his education and football career. So he moved out of his family home to avoid infecting others and went to live with his butcher uncle. For Camus, the isolation, but most crucially the illness itself, as well as seeing animals being killed to feed human, gave him a sharp existential focus about the nature of life. So he became deeply interested in philosophy, specifically the pessimistic philosophy of Schopenhauer and the atheistic philosophy of Nietzsche, and the egalitarian philosophy of Marx. Through Nietzsche, particularly his influential book The Birth of Tragedy, he also discovered ancient Greek philosophers. I should point out that Anton Chekhov, the Russian genius, also lived with tuberculosis for a long period of his life. As a result, he also had a very bleak and pessimistic view of life. Both, however, turned that pessimism to optimism, Camus mostly through philosophy and Chekhov through storytelling. Not just that, both Camus and Chekhov were deeply interested and involved in theatre. In 1933, Camus entered the University of Algiers and not surprisingly, he studied philosophy and wrote his thesis on Plotinus, the ancient Egyptian-born Greco-Roman philosopher who, like Plato, emphasized ideas over matter, mind over body. Plotinus was influenced by Eastern philosophy as he traveled to Persia and learned about Indian enlightenment to escape the cycle of reincarnation. Plotinus was also the pioneer of Neoplatonism, which gave Plato's philosophy an Eastern flavor by emphasizing unity of mind and body and the idea of one universal being. In his university thesis, Camus juxtaposed Christianity with ancient Greek philosophy, arguing that the Christian premise of afterlife made this life almost meaningless and redundant because you could die at birth and go straight to heaven. Living a long life can only increase your chance of committing more sins, which could take you to hell. It makes sense not to live very long if heaven is guaranteed for babies. So basically, for Camus, most religions didn't value this life, only treated it as a test for afterlife. Camus understood that the Greeks, on the other hand, celebrated this life despite their belief in the divine power. And no surprise that Camus, just like Nietzsche, returned to ancient Greece to find a true atheistic meaning for life in one of his most famous work, The Myth of Sisyphus, which I will discuss later. Outside study, Camus had two passions, actually three. First, he played goalkeeper in a professional football or soccer team in Algeria. As a goalkeeper, you have a clear view of the entire football pitch, which gives you a better perspective in terms of who is who and where they stand which must have helped him with the power of philosophical and artistic observation. For Camus, football also represented a small tribe that gave him a sense of belonging and togetherness and with a common purpose and goal, pun intended. But unfortunately, his football career was cut short after he was infected with tuberculosis. Such is life. From the midst of football tribalism, he retreated to an isolated corner of a butcher's house like some injured animal. Life is really absurd. His second passion also involved tribalism, the theatre and communism. Camus in 1936 joined the French Communist Party and later the Algerian Communist Party, so he organized a workers' theatre. After he was expelled from the party, he continued his theatre involvement because it allowed him that sense of togetherness and teamwork. Camus was drawn to Marxism because it emphasizes a group bond. Later in life, he continued to work with the theatre and he famously and quite ironically staged Dostoevsky's Demons, a novel that questions a communist revolution, which I have discussed here. By then, Camus was no longer a communist because he had grown old enough to see the other side of a communist revolution that began suppressing individual freedom in the USSR. His third passion, and perhaps the most important one too, of course, as a Frenchman or any man, was sex. He married twice but also had a lot of sex on the side. 
I guess a man's ultimate purpose in life is to pass on his genes. Camus was blessed with good looks. He was handsome, masculine, and had a status as a successful writer, which allowed him access to many women. In 1940, many French were fleeing the French capital from the German occupation. Camus, however, instead of escaping the fire, moved to Paris to work for a newspaper. It paid off as his writing became more popular, he grew more well-known and famous. In Paris, he met the other existentialist giant Jean-Paul Sartre. Now, interesting to point out, Camus and Sartre came from two polar opposites. Sartre from wealthy bourgeois family and Camus from a relative poverty, but both found Marxism very appealing. But later, they fell out due to the ideological differences. Sartre was keen on a Maoist-style revolution, while Camus wanted a peaceful reform. His 1942 novel, The Stranger, made him a celebrity, so much so that people paid to attend his lectures. Not just that, he received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1957, aged 44, making him the second youngest writer ever to receive the prize after Rudyard Kipling, who was 41 in 1907. Such is the absurdities of life, when you go up, you always have to come down, just like the boulder of Sisyphus. At the height of his fame and success, in 1960, while returning back from a holiday, the car he was traveling in crashed into a tree, killing him instantly. In his pocket, the police found an unused train ticket to Paris. He was supposed to travel by train with his wife and kids, but for some bizarre reason, he had chosen to travel by car, driven by his publisher, Gallimard, who also died in the crash. They also found a 144-page manuscript of his novel in progress, The First Man, an autobiographical novel about his life growing up in Algeria. Perhaps a novel similar to Proust's In Search of Lost Time, taking a more artistic approach to fiction and less philosophical. Today, Abba Camus is considered one of the most influential novelist philosophers of the 20th century. Now I'll discuss four of his most famous novels and two of his philosophical essays before I tell you 10 philosophical lessons we can draw from them.